Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a privilege and pleasure to be here. I came straight from Kyiv, Ukraine. It took me 26 hours to get here, but it was definitely worth the trip. <laughs> You know, sometimes you think you will stop being emotional, but it is not true. When I watched this clip, I just couldn't hold my tears. And then I want to start with quoting my mom, first of all, because it's Mother's Day today, it's a good point to do, but also because she says that you cannot say thank you too many times. And I want to say thank you to people of Belgium for providing homes for people of my country who are in need, for making sure that they have a warm cup of tea and the roof over their head, and the ability for the children to continue their studies, to find friends, and imagine, pretend that there is a peace. Thank you for what you are doing. It is truly generational, and on behalf of my people, we will never forget it. Thank you. We are getting closer to 15 months since Russia started a full-scale invasion on us. There are some lessons that we learned over this time, and today I want to share them with you. The first lesson is a lesson of unity. You know, we did realize at the very beginning that it is very much a David versus Goliath situation. And that there would be uh, some magic way, magic pill, for us to be able to survive and for us to be able to have a chance, a hope to win the war. And it turned out that this magic recipe is that you can win if you are not fighting alone. On the day one of full-scale invasion, the bombarding of Kiev started at 5 a.m. When things like that start, the main responsibility of Ukrainian parliament is to gather together in the chambers and vote for the martial law to begin, to move country to the war wheels. And this is what we had to do. So 5 a.m., when there were explosions everywhere, we started calling each other from parliamentary party leaders, asking what are we going to do, how are we going to get people into the chambers, and how many people would actually come. Kiev was in collapse. People were trying to evacuate their families. There was traffic everywhere. People were scared. Some were hiding. And of course, our security said, Red Cross, absolutely no, no one is getting anywhere. Putin announced that he wants to destroy Ukrainian government. And we did not know what we are going to do. A Ukrainian parliament is an all Soviet building located in the center of the huge park. And so it's like a no-brainer for a pilot to destroy it right away. And this was one of the arguments of like, how are we going to do what we are going to do next? So we gathered uh, in the buildings alongside the parliament. And when the security said that we will have 10 minutes for all of it, we started getting people in. The building was dark and there were many people in military uniform and the windows was covered with the bags of sand. And when we ran into the chambers and started looking around, we have seen that of 420 members of parliament, almost 400 came. And for the 10 minutes that we were desperately clicking our buttons, calling for the world to help us win, to help us stand, to help us survive, announcing martial law, uh, calling for leaders of the free world to stand with us. We were holding hands and singing national anthem. It was one of the most emotional moments in my life. And at that particular moment, we also made a vow between political parties. We said that for no matter how painful it will be, for as long as it needs, we will stand united and act as one 
as Team Ukraine. And right now, 15 months in, I can tell you one thing. It is indeed very painful. Politicians are not set to work together. But we also are a living proof of the point that there is something bigger than politics, something bigger than your ambitions. It is a matter of survival for your country. It is a matter of something that you believe in. And it is the second lesson, and this lesson is values. You know, we are all saying we are fighting for democratic values, for liberal values, for what we believe in. But honestly, you will only start really feeling what you are doing when it's a matter of life and death for you. When it's a matter if you are going to go to the front or you are going to support your country or you are going to stand up and say, no, we are not going to bend. We are going to define our own future. And our future is with European Union. You know, one of the... One of the first good things that happened since full-scale invasion was the moment when we get, get the candidacy to European Union. And it was indeed a very sensitive and tense moment for all of us. For me personally, because so many of my friends who went as volunteers to the front, they actually were tying to their backpacks two flags, Ukrainian flag, and flag of European Union. Because if you ask people uh, at the streets of Ukraine, they will say, yeah, yeah, well, we are probably somewhere already there, just the paperwork is lost in the mail. Because this is what we feel. We are Europeans. And this is what Russia wants to destroy. A fact that a post-Soviet country can define its own future, and its future is not with Russia. Its future with, is with European countries, European values, liberal values, values of freedom. <laughs> and so you can imagine how, how important it is for us to, was for us to get the candidacy status. And a couple of days before, when we were still in the negotiations and pushes, uh, I was thinking, geez, if we would not get it, what would I tell people at the front that they were fighting under the wrong flag? And so, luckily, we are in the candidacy is ours, and I've been to Brussels at the day when there was a decision. First of all, thank you so much for supporting us in this, but also, if you hear a story about a crazy woman running around European Commission building, <laughs> screaming, yay, Ukraine on that day, it may or may not be me. <laughs> <laughs> not too many people understand what the candidacy means, but here I will tell you, my dad says, I don't know really like what the details are there, but right now I feel that our country has a future. And for that, I'm so grateful. And I hope that you all realize how much it means and how important it is for us. The European values and the membership in the European Union as, as a result, as a sign that we are all together. The third lesson is that unpunished evil always returns. One can think that we have all learned that from Hollywood blockbusters, right? But apparently, no. The war in my country started not last year. It started in 2014, when Russia annexed Crimea and when Russia attacked and annexed our eastern territories. And th since that time, the impunity that Putin felt allowed him to move forward and attack us again. And he will not stop unless he's stopped. And this is what we aim to do. And this is what we are doing. <clears throat> In
in a, a month into the full-scale invasion, when Russians were pushed back out of Kyiv, and Bucha and Irpin were liberated, I was one of the members of parliamentary delegations that went in on the day one. It was the best and the worst decision that I ever made. The best decision is that we know and we believe that at one day there would be a tribunal, there would be a trial. We hope it will happen in Hague, but... And Putin will be on the bench. And at that moment, he will say that nothing of that happened, that it was all a setup. This is what they do. Then, myself and people like me we will be there to say no. We have seen that, we have witnessed that, and we have proofs. The worst idea of going there was because I have seen dead bodies alongside the road, mass graves, uh, women who were raped and sexually assaulted by Russians, and it will stay with me forever. But it will also make me remember what happens when evil is unpunished. And you should do everything, literally everything, to make sure that that would never happen anywhere again. We need to have tribunal, not only because it is fair and it will bring justice to people who suffered all those atrocities, but because what we are fighting for is not just of restoring our sovereignty and winning the war. We are fighting against the precedent that in 21st century, one country can annex territory of another country can commit all war crimes from the war crimes list and get away with it. Because it is not only about Russia. There are so many tyrants in the whole world who are watching. And they are watching precisely. They are watching so closely at any sign of weakness of the democratic countries, of the democratic unities. Because they look for an opportunity for themselves to commit something like that. Because if Russia can, then so many others can. And this is what we say, no. This is, we, this is where we say, we will not allow that. And winning the war and getting the justice for all Ukrainian people will send a very strong message to all the other dictatorships in the world. It, will, it, it happened before, but it will not pass in 21st century. We will not allow that. And then comes the question of peace, about how the peace would look like. Why don't you guys negotiate? What is the story? Maybe there is a time to sit down at the table of negotiations. And here comes a very personal story. I was born a couple of years before Soviet Union collapsed. As a Ukrainian, I have gone through all the struggles that my country has gone. Collapse of Soviet Union, then terrible poverty, then revolutions, 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 and then war. And when I became a politician, I had one very simple goal. I wanted for us to build a country where children would be free in their choices, where they do not have to be born to historic events, where they will be free and will be able to make their own decisions build a country that they want, pursue their dreams. That was my goal, like very simple one, right? And now we are robbed of that. Because this generation of kids that we were raising with such love, they have seen dead bodies. They know how to act during air raid sirens, how to study in the basement. They know that the subway is a place where you run when there's bombarding everywhere. They know how to run from their homes, how to lose their friends, how to lose their parents. They ask their parents like the worst question that a parent could hear, like, mommy, are we refugees now? So there is one particular thing that we owe to those children. They should not have to fight this war again. 
This is what we owe them, and this is why it ends on our generation. We will go through that, we will win the war, and they will be free. There is one more. Thank you so much. I always feel so humbled and I want to share, to share this feeling with Ukrainians when I come back home. The tremendous and unprecedented support that we get from people who, who don't know us, who did not know anything about us like just, just a year and a half ago. And it's so amazing, so amazing how we all were able to unite together when we realize that we are fighting for the same things. By the way, every time when you hear about Ukraine moving forward on the battlefield or having little victories, for all of you who support us, I want you to look at the mirror and say, we did well, <laughs> because it is true. <laughs> So there is the last one. And this lesson is that impossible is nothing. You know, a year and three months ago, not too many people believed that we will stand for more than a couple of days or a week, right? Then not too many people believed that we'll push them out of Kiev. Then, so many people did not believe that we will get the candidacy to the European Union. Then, almost nobody believed that we were able for a counteroffense and we will get Kherson back. <coughs> then, nobody believed that we will get heavy weapons. Then, nobody believed that we will get Patriot missiles. And of course, nobody believed in a tank coalition. But you know what is the most important? That we believed it. And we proved that once you are willing to fight with all your heart and with no regrets, impossible things would happen. We also have told the story to the whole world that you yourself are capable of more than the world thinks of you and also then you think of yourself. And this is the story of Ukraine. Right now, there are people who are still skeptical about the counteroffense and us winning the war and regaining our sovereignty. There are people who are skeptical about us getting the, uh, the membership in European Union, membership in NATO, making sure that we use Russian money for the reparation and rebuilding of Ukraine making sure that we will return our people back and we will build strong and prosperous country, having a core as liberal values. But there is one thing I can tell you. Watch us. Thank you so much. And glory to Ukraine. Thank you, Kira.
Thank you so much, Kira, for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kira Rudik. Thank you. 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 Thank you.